So again, thank you for joining us today. And I am pleased to introduce Dr. Tarek Akmal, Chair of the Department of Teaching and Learning, and Dr. Sharon Cruz, Chair of the Department of Educational Leadership and Sport Management, who will be talking with us today on involuntary homeschooling. With COVID-19 shutting down schools, businesses, and non-essential operations globally, many parents have found themselves in the new role of teacher. Dr. Akmal, can you kick us off with an overview of the Department of Teaching and Learning? Uh, yes, th thank you very much for having us. Uh, we're, we're pleased to be here. And uh, I wanted to also share that not only am I the chair of TNL, but I've also been, I'm just the past president of the WACT Association, the Washington Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. So I've been working statewide with my colleagues on all of the things that have happened with COVID-19 this spring, and it's been a lot. So we've been in close proximity with uh, virtually, of course, with schools, as well as each other, other institutions along the way. Uh, TNL is a department that primarily the biggest function is that we do teacher preparation, but we also have uh, six graduate programs that go along with it. And I can name all those off if you want, but they're not necessarily relevant to today's conversation. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, Dr. Cruz, can you provide an overview of the Department of Educational Leadership and Sport Management? Absolutely, and thanks for having us and hosting us today. This is really um, a nice opportunity for both of us. Um, I am Sharon Cruz and I am the Department Chair for Educational Leadership and Sport Management on the multi-system campuses. I am also the Academic Director for the Unit of Education on the Vancouver campus. Um, as Tarek is the past president of WACD, I am the incoming president of WESAP, which is the Washington Council of Educational Administration Programs. And so like Tarek, um, we've been very much involved in what's happening COVID related and otherwise, as it relates to schools across the state in the past um, several months. And our administrative um, group works, has been working very closely with the teacher ed group um, to make sure that leaders are on board with these changes in education as our teachers. Um, on the Vancouver campus, we have um, five different programs that educate teachers as well. They mirror many of what's on the Pullman campus. And across the system, we have programs in the Tri-Cities, Spokane, Vancouver, and Pullman campuses that certify principals, principal assistants, and um, superintendents in the leadership side of the house. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that sport management is also part of my role and we're extremely proud of the ways in which we create leaders to run sports organizations across the state. Wonderful, thank you. We'll head into our uh, initial question and answer series. So what has the COVID-19 pandemic taught us about the U.S. school system? So we thought we'd preface this um, a little bit by by talking about this is a very temporary situation. This is not, I, I often hear people say, this is the new normal. We're gonna deal with this for how long? No, it's not the new normal. It's as I've talked to my faculty and our students, this is a temporary abnormal. This is not the way it's going to be the rest of our, our careers. And so we're wrestling with this, uh, in this difficult situation and it is a difficult situation. I think one of the things we have to acknowledge before we go too much further, is that there's been a lot of loss this spring. I mean, not just in terms of human lives, but in terms of kids' experiences in school and what they might be having. And so high school kids missed out on all the activities of spring. Uh, some of the big ones are upcoming, right? Graduation. And that's a huge step for high school seniors, and they're not going to have that except virtually this year in, in various ways. So that's been very challenging. And, and I think the loss uh, also for all of us of that structure that we all have around schooling that goes with it. So those are some pretty important pieces because our lives are built around work schedules and school schedules. Mm -hmm. And uh, as those shifted and changed, it really created a whole bunch of uncertainty and structural changes to our lives, which then caused more uncertainty. And now we have even more uncertainty in terms of where we're gonna be and how long we're gonna go on. And so it's really important for us to recognize those things. But in terms of what's, what has COVID-19 taught us about the US school system, I would say that, um, and Sharon is gonna jump in here at any moment, we'll go back and forth. Uh, I would say that really it didn't teach us much about the system we didn't already know. You know, the, the thing that's happened here is, if anything, uh, we knew the system going in didn't serve all children the same, uh, that it wasn't able to meet all the inequities that we have in our societies and, and the, the formal informal structures that we have in some cases uh, caused those, those uh, situations to get worse. 
Then along came COVID-19 and all of a sudden it magnifies who has jobs that are white collar that can now be at home with their kids, be able to work from home remotely. Who lost their jobs? Who are essential workers who are now scrambling to stay safe, stay healthy, and also support their, their children, their families if they're in school? So a lot of things are going on right now. And what, what COVID-19 has really done is magnified those, those differences. And to, and to add to that, I think it's the way in which we also know that not every school district and every school system and every school, even within the same school system, has the same opportunities for kids. And we're seeing real differences in the ability of districts and schools within districts to respond to the families and kids' needs. It's very, very different if you've got incredibly good Wi-Fi and live in an urban area when you don't in, in some you know, more suburban and more rural areas and even some inner areas of some of our urban centers. So access to Wi-Fi has really changed the ways in which um, students can access what's being provided to them. And that's an ongoing inequity that we've had along. It's just an example of that. We know that all schools are not created equal as hard as we try across the state of Washington. I also think the other thing that this has really surfaced, again, it's not that we didn't already know this, but I think people are paying much more attention to the role of schools in providing social services to students. I'm sure all of us have seen the signs and the buses and the newspaper articles about the really important role um, our administrators and teachers are spending in making sure kids get fed. And you know, there isn't just one. There isn't anybody among us that didn't understand that free and reduced lunch was part of what schools did. Maybe some people understood that breakfast was a lot of what schools were doing. Maybe some people understood that weekend backpacks were some things that some schools were doing. But now this is highlighted in a way that people are understanding the role of caretaking uh, that teachers and administrators have taken on um, in ways that I'm not sure everybody understood. I think, and furthermore, adding on to that, Sharon, building on is that school counselors, the role they play, and all the social services that come through school, healthcare, healthcare screening, and, and all those pieces are now interrupted. And this, this is challenging our system in ways that it hasn't been challenged before. Thank you. And you touched on this briefly, but what are some of the challenges that parents and caretakers have faced with the closure of these schools? <laughs> Again, they're, they're wide ranging and, and very, very different. And, you know, it's going to be different in each household. And Eastern Washington is different from Western Washington. Rural Garfield County, which has zero confirmed cases and zero, um, you know, zero deaths from it, obviously, if there's no cases. Uh, for them, because the population density is so thin, uh, it's not an issue of bumping into people all the time. And so it's, it's very remote. But I think that that, that balancing act in, you know, of schooling and working, um, if you're a parent who's an essential services worker who's still working right now, you've got that additional panic of keeping yourself safe and healthy and mm -hmm. simultaneously supporting your child who is now going to school during the workday while you are at work, but at home. Um, so hopefully there's family members available or that there's some kind of a situation for structured support. So it's going to vary greatly. Now, it also depends on what kind of a job you have. Are you able to spend that time supporting your students at home while you're supposed to be doing a full-time job someplace else remotely while you're all using the same bandwidth uh, as well? So I think those are some of the very simple examples of, of the time that it's taking, the effort it's taking, and the variation that already exists. And I'm sure Sharon will add to this. Uh, I didn't want to try to cover everything, Sharon. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, well, and I'd really, I, I, think, I think everything Tarek said is, is really spot on, but I also want to talk about the social emotional burden that, parent, that parents and caretakers are really facing with kids. This, this is super uncertain. It's uncertain for them. It's uncertain for their kids. And the opportunity for them to interact in ways around their own feelings of change and loss of control and loss of relatedness or, you know, that's experiencing their lives it makes it hard for them to come to their students. It's, it's, it's tough for a high school um, parent to say, yeah, you're missing prom, I really feel for you, but I just lost my job, right? And so there's this social emotional burden, or, or even I haven't lost my job, but look at how hard I'm working from home, you know, you'll get over it. And so I think there's also this added social emotional burden as our students are really suffering from, um, you know, the ability to understand what's happening or what's going to happen to them. And it's the same fear that their parents are dealing with. So in, in the best of cases, families are able to come around and support each other, but that's really hard. And it's a lot to ask of people that are just trying to sort things out. So I think that social emotional piece that schools are taking on, 
in, in bigger and better ways um, all the time are suffering here as well. Our ability to be well connected to others. I mean, what's the hallmark of this pandemic? This, it's isolation. Yeah. And students thrive on connectedness. Kids thrive on connectedness. Adults need it. And so I think that's the other added challenge and burden is just dealing with um, who we are as people and what we need. And even though social media is out there, kids are discovering they need more than social media. Seeing somebody on a screen, we as adults, we are, we are suffering from Zoom fatigue because mm -hmm. we're listening so intensely uh, and trying to track and follow every nuance of whoever we're talking to and, and what they're doing. And so that adds another layer of tiredness on top of all of this, which means the potential for misreading and misrelating to your kids or talking with your kids or supporting your kids um, and other members of your family is out there as well because you're tired, you're stressed, you're worried about yourself, you're worried about your kids. You're, you're, and, and in general, I would say the worry level nationally is pretty high. I think everybody's carrying a very heavy load uh, in the Department of Emotional and Psychological Burden. Oh, very, very true. <laughs> what are the uh, future implications of this pandemic on the school system? Go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, I thought you were going to do that one, Terry. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I, so on one side, I really want to point out the fact that schools in the current format have been around for, you know, just about 100 years in this country. They've got some institutional momentum. I don't know that really six months after this is all over, whatever that means, we're going to see a whole lot of change here. Um, I do think that there are some implications in terms of the ways in which issues of inequality that we've already broke, brought up, issues of social emotional learning that we've already brought up, will be better discussed, thought, thought about in more deep ways, um, problem solved, and, and more openly brought to the table. I think some of the ways in which we've not been willing to face the inequities of schools um, that kind of gotten swept under the carpet now are ways in which folks really have to embrace this. So I think that's a huge first future implication. I think another implication that um, in getting ready for this talk and I talked about was the awareness of the public. The idea of flipped classrooms, as we've called them in vernacular for quite a while, the idea that there is some work in either a distance format or an online format or in a Blackboard or Moodle or Canvas or Google Hangout kind of format that supplements classroom um, education has been around for two or three decades. It's not new. I think it's new to the public. And so I think in some ways, one of the future Im implications that directly have to deal with that kind of technology-oriented learning, technology-enabled learning will become more commonplace. I think it'll get credited to the pandemic and it, pre it predates it, but I think if we're going to look at one change, that's probably a very positive move forward is the embracing of tech-enhanced learning for students who can work that way in more um, readily available ways. Yeah, I think uh, those are great points, Sharon. I think one of the other implications is, is that level of awareness of what schools do and how much they do with children every day that is not really about knowledge and skills. It's not really about textbook learning. It's about a whole bunch of other things and the consistency and the, the routine that school provides to children, the structure that school provides to children in some cases, uh, it's the only constant in their lives. And that has now been, been adjusted. And so maybe that realization that, wow, we need to do more for, for kids, especially those who are doing without. And those are important pieces. And that, that awareness level has really come up as well. Um, I think people are very appreciative, teachers and principals and school counselors and all the folks who are working so hard right now uh, to support kids. But for some teachers, this was very challenging to make the shift over and they were given very little time, you know, essentially 10 days to get going. And um, so they were, they were challenged to do that too. And yet we have some pretty remarkable fun stories of what people have been doing to be supportive uh, at the same time as some kids, unfortunately, of course, are being left out. And there are schools that are struggling to reach out and connect, particularly way out in rural and remote areas uh, with kids who live far, far from school. So the implications are probably that we have to create better networking tools. And we definitely have to think about broadband access, um, I think, in those supports. I, I don't think school is going to become online but I, uh, at all. But I think the tools that we use to support school are, are being sharpened at this point. 
So to that point, um, how far or are kids being set back by not being in a traditional classroom setting? Uh, I'm going first, Tara. Okay, go for it. Uh, schools take kids as they come. And there is no such thing as a fourth grader. You know, every fourth grader shows up with a different readiness in a traditional learning time. They're all gonna show up with a different readiness and schools will work with them and schools will educate and schools will take those kids where they're at and move them forward. Um, I also think there's some ways in which we really have to attend to the fact that many kids, not all kids obviously, but many kids have learned a lot about themselves and have learned in real deep areas around things that um, are going to put them ahead from where they might have been. Um, I think we have to be really careful not to romanticize traditional schooling. Um, and the pacing and the structure of traditional schooling um, works for a lot of kids. It doesn't work for other kids. And so I think there's some ways, instead of being worried about them being set back, I think we have to address the fact that they're going to come with strengths, they're going to come with needs, and this is a well-oiled profession. They will respond to these kids. And they'll respond to them intellectually, they'll respond to them socially, they'll respond to them in related fashion, and they will do the best they absolutely can to provide a good, safe, high quality education where kids come in the door. And the flip side of that is that there are kids right now who actually are benefiting from not being in a traditional social setting because they don't work well with other kids, they don't fit in well with other kids, they've been victims of bullying, they've been victims of social ostracism. And so I've got a teacher who tells me, one of the stories she says is I've got this one kid who's just flourishing right now in, in art uh, because this is a medium he can work in very well online and he is doing better work than he's ever done when he was in school because he's free of all the restraints that he had socially that were being caused by what was going on there. Um, that said, I mean, there is one population that I think we also have to acknowledge here that it's, that's, we're struggling to serve as educators, and that's in special education. I yeah. mean, children with special needs, the range of needs that they have and the kinds of things that we can actually do on Zoom are somewhat limited. So if you're working with the kid and, the, and the, the response, you know, the technique that's being used is the student is supposed to pick up and manipulate something that is in front of them, and you're not there with them, it's really hard to do over Zoom. And so there are, I think, uh, there are some real limitations to see there. So neither of us is under any um, misguided perception that this is better for all kids and that it's all working magically. It's, it's not, it's not, no. but it's very, no. very mixed. Thank you. We just had a question come into the chat. Do you think that we'll see a shift in the academic year structure to a year round approach? That's a great question. Other states are considering that. The, um, it's happened in lots of places. The question we have to ask is why do we have the school calendar that we do? Mm -hmm. and at this point, the answer to that is we're not sure actually. Uh, we know why it started that way, but we don't know why we still do it this way. And I think it's uh, primarily built around the factor that everybody's schedules are built around school. And I mean, if you look at COVID-19, one of the ways to send the message in the state of Washington that there's a problem right now and that we're taking it very seriously is to close schools. And so when schools are closed, everyone gets the message, this is serious. So much of what we do and how we do it is built around children going to school in a certain particular calendar, which in itself is built around the agricultural calendar, which with mechanization being what it is, is very different now than it was when we first set up the school calendar. And shifting to a year-round school model solves some problems. I mean, the, the idea of summer setback, which is, you know, well-documented, um, is certainly solved um, by a year-round calendar. There are ways in which it also provides additional instructional time for kids, and it provides additional opportunity to um, deepen their learning around issues of analysis and creativity and evaluation and, and really, you know, do interdisciplinary work because it provides more time to strengthen the ties, the cognitive ties that they're making in content areas. On the other hand, it sets a whole set of other challenges up in terms of, you know, kids do need breaks. They need an opportunity and, and, and faculty and staff need breaks. They need that opportunity to step away from their learning, to have other experiences. And so if we go to year round schools, how do we make sure that we purposefully build that in? How do we build childhood back in for kids? And summer is an opportunity for a lot of kids to experience 
childhood, free play, you know, all of those sorts of things, exploration. And so it, it's, it's more than just opening up the doors more days. It really takes a thoughtful look at the curriculum, the instructional modalities, and the other ways kids need to be supported for and as being kids. And it can't be decided unilaterally. It has to be decided with the communities in which those schools are set because all of us uh, have calendars that mesh up with schools. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We had another question come into the chat. Do you think that there will be curriculum changes to prep teachers for being ready for online learning going that's forward? A, that, that's a great question because actually we're already doing a lot of that and have been doing a lot of that for quite a few that's years. Fun. So across the state, teacher prep programs are all required to teach about technology. And one of the observations Chris Rakedahl made in a phone call that Sharon and I were on was he said, the young teachers are having no trouble making the shift over this. It's the, the seasoned veterans who are saying, wow, you know, I've got a lot of things set up for face to face. This is really hard to make this change over. And so I think one of the things that we're looking at right now is as we prepare our students going forward, regardless of what model of school is ahead of them, we wanna make sure that our candidates are ready to deal with whatever comes their way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they take classes that teach them how to teach online, teach how to develop websites, how to teach and deliver at a distance. They, they get all of those pieces in various ways. They're very rarely required to actually use them. So this has been a time where it's, it's come to the forefront in terms of what they've had to do. Yeah, I'd agree with all of that. And I, and I think the other piece about this is what we have made an effort to do and we'll continue to make an effort to do is to make sure that the online format is not a, a bad imitation of a face-to-face -face format. Good online teaching is not a lecture to a bunch of kids in the Brady Bunch format. It is, it's using breakout rooms. It's, it's providing some opportunity for instruction and then a break for people to go out and do independent or small group practice and then come back together. The idea that all you do is take what is a traditional lecture model and move it into an online environment, I think has been really well proven to be very ineffective. And so when we work with our students, is it's the creative aspects of the tech environment. It's the ways they actually leave the Zoom meeting or the, or the Hangout or the, or the Connect piece that they're on and go out elsewhere to other types of really lovely good lessons that are created out you know there's a bunch of good stuff by nasa there's a bunch of good stuff out of almost every museum that exists art museums are doing amazingly good virtual stuff and so the idea is you know good teachers in an online environment have created scavenger hunts around those things where students go outside of this environment do that work and then come back and share and demonstrate their own sense of what they've created either through a Google Doc or some other technologically enhanced format to share that learning. So I think the piece about it is, is not so much that can they do it, it's can they do it well and what are we doing to really help them build new thinking around what it looks like to teach to an important standard, to an important objective, to have students demonstrate that they're learning the skill sets in ways that can be mediated in the technological environment. And let's challenge the concept of what is curriculum. Right. That it's not just the written documents that we use for a course of study in a classroom, that it can be anywhere, any place, and students can develop and help develop their own curriculum along the way. And so there's so many ways to, to provide very rich, very deep, meaningful learning experiences outside of having a teacher facilitator only or rather maybe tasks that are set up by the teacher, students can go do independently in small groups and then return for conversation afterwards to cement that learning. So I think everything Sharon has said is spot on. And are you? Oh, similar to what you guys were just talking about, um, what are some options for parents who are unable to school their children? Well, this is something Sharon and I have talked about, and we've actually discussed this quite a bit across our multiple campuses, and different people are doing different things in lots of ways. And one of the things is, is that right now we have an incredibly varied experience for school kids mm -hmm. in homes where you may not have internet, in homes where the parents are struggling to do two jobs, and so they don't have a lot of extra time right now, and the caregivers are the high school students in the family, um, and they're balancing their high school curriculum with all of this, and they're not prepared to be teachers either. I mean, almost none of us are prepared to be good teachers of, you know, school teachers. We should be, as parents, we are the first teachers of our children. So that's a piece of it, but that becomes formalized then by through schooling and so on. 
But there are lots of things we can do at home with kids that are educational, that are beneficial, and that are really, I think, very useful at this time. And one is, and Sharon and I talked about this a couple of days ago, or she mentioned it maybe yesterday, was this is an opportunity, if you can make the time, to really get to know your kid. And the academic side and, and the personal side, the intersection of the social and the emotional and the intellectual of your student at home. Now, we're not set up to be teachers at home. We're probably not very good at it even. But there are loads of things that we can do to invite our students in to enjoy. And I think Sharon and I will rattle a few of those off in a minute. But I want to make sure she has her piece before I say anything else. This is, a, you know, as I talked about earlier, you know, it, we're, all, we're all suffering from a lack of relatedness, a lack of connection. Uh, with other people. And the Zoom environment, as lovely as it is, doesn't allow for time for that one-on-one -on -one piece. And I think one thing parents can really do is connect one-on-one -on -one with their kids. And, and so now we're going to the lit litany of what they do. Take your kid for a walk. Look at the trees. You know, identify the flowers. Almost everybody has got one of these and you can take pictures of what's in, oops, what's in your um, environment. And, you know, Learn what the native plants in your area are. Learn the phases of the moon, which is a call one of the, our colleagues has um, developed a lesson for kids to go out and do that in the evenings to sketch those out and to study those pieces. Um, you know, re read to your kids, read with your kids. Um, they, going back to our other point, they will be just fine. It, 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 they will eventually learn fractions, unless that's your gig and unless you really love this idea. You know, you can set some of that down and take some time to separate out what it is that you do well and can enjoy with your child and what it is that you can. I mean, one of my favorite tweets early on in all, in all of this was um, the Michigan State Teacher of the Year tweeted the fact that her student, her, her own kids were unimpressed that they now had the Michigan State Teacher of the Year as their homeschool teacher. I mean, there are just limitations to that relationship. And so I'd argue that what you need to do is build on what you have and what you can do. You know, bread baking is amazing. There's a lot of science in that. I mean, I've stolen all the good ones, Tar. I oh, no, there's, there's plenty more. I mean, uh, I see Don McMahon, one of our colleagues, has listed, listed an app in the chat box for folks if they would like to utilize that. Um, but I, I also would say that the, the kitchen is a great place, as the old saying goes, and, and uh, there's more chemistry and science in the kitchen than in any laboratory. Involve your kids in tasks in the kitchen. Involve your kids in measurement. Involve your kids in counting uh, for young children. And this is typically where, you know, what are, what are the things we can do with younger children? Because that's where the need is greatest. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as Sharon said, reading to your kids. But also you can watch Sesame Street with your kids. One of the things that almost every home has right now is television and kids TV programming. You've got to be careful with it, obviously. But there's so much good educational programming right now that we that we have not always had. And so parents can actually sit with their kids and just talk about what do they like? What do they think? You know, what would they have done if they were if, if their kids were in that situation? What would they have done? And just these kinds of conversations open doors to very rich learning situations with children. And, and kids want to know what parents think. And all too often, we're in a role of decision-making for our kids. We have a chance here where we can let them make some decisions, ask some questions, and we can be uncertain and model for them that, you know, we don't know everything, even though they think we do. Um, and it's wonderful, but we can learn with our kids just as well. But I think getting outside right now, I've seen more kids on my street on bicycles than in all the years I've lived in this house, which is now 15 years. I'm seeing more kids and families outside together, which I think is a wonderful thing. So those are all really positive outcomes right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, every celebrity is reading out loud somewhere online, <laughs> you know, and that's an opportunity for your kid to have some autonomy and some control. Who do they want to hear read to them? What book do they want to, they want to choose? It's the way in which, you know, it becomes this opportunity to learn how to talk to your kid about what it is they like and dislike and, and, where they have some sense of control will make them feel stronger and make them feel more secure in this environment as well. Um, I have a neighbor that jokes with me all the time that uh, they are now teaching, they're now teaching high level animal behavior in their backyard. Their kid is teaching their dog tricks. The dog is very talented now, um, but it really is. I mean, it's a great science lesson. It is one of the basic pieces of positive and negative reinforcement. You know, so I think, I think folks who have the bandwidth to do this and the opportunity to think it through 
Um, it's an opportunity to connect with your kid in a way that they're not going to remember whether or not they learned fractions during the pandemic. They're going to remember whether mom or dad spent time with them. They're going to remember whether mom and dad listened to them. And they're going to rem remember whether, you know, there was an opportunity and a space for them in that relationship to be themselves. And I really want to stress that with folks. Schools are going to be fine. Your kids are going to be fine. We are going to come out of this at some point. And then hopefully we won't go back to what we've termed as normal. I think there are some changes we do need to make, definitely. And I think we're learning from those changes. Go ahead, sorry, we are out no, of you're time. Fine. Yeah, I was just gonna say, unfortunately we're out of time, um, but I wanted to extend a big thank you to everyone who joined us and to Dr. Akbal and Cruz for their time this afternoon. Um, a friendly reminder, keep checking foundation.wsu.edu slash fireside. And uh, we will keep that updated with more faculty series that we'll be sending. Um, but thank you again. This was great. Thank, thank you. you.